Hello everyone and welcome. In this episode we are going to be talking about a new work which was created in response to or even inspired by an early musical work. That's Dido's Ghost, a British opera premiered in the summer of 2021 which continues the story of Henry Purcell's now famous work, Dido and Aeneas. So, are you ready for this? Join me in our combined strength. Bring order to the galaxy. is the Early Music Podcast with your host, Andrew Byrne. Brought to you by Rayma, the Early Music Network. Kawabunga. Episode 7. Dido's Ghost was the brainchild of composer Errol and Wallen and librettist Wesley Stace, and was co-commissioned by the Barbican, Buxton International Festival, Dunedin Consort, Edinburgh International Festival, Mahogany Opera, and the Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra and Chorale. The opera is intended as a sequel to Henry Purcell's Dido and Aeneas from 1688. <laughs> work which is lauded today as a keystone in English musical history. Purcell's opera, however, was by no means a great success in his lifetime. It received possibly three performances over three years at a girls' boarding school in Chelsea. The work reappeared after his death, rearranged and incorporated into other theatrical forms, and disappeared sometime in the mid-18th century. After its revival in 1895, it became part of the classical music canon. One of the peculiarities of this piece as a living part of British musical heritage is that, despite its cultural status today, its many recordings and performances, the original score is in fact lost. There are so many additions of the Purcell, and we don't have the existing original manuscript. That's Erilyn Wallen, composer of Dido's Ghost. And it made me think a lot about uh, the nature of opera, how each production is different, you have different things. So scholars think, oh, how come that's in that version, not in that version? And there's so many questions around it, and I suddenly thought, actually, because when you're writing for the stage, the score comes first, people learn it, but then the practicalities of stage means that you make constant changes and adaptations. And I think all these questions that we have about the Purcell actually reflect what it is to put on opera. There's always, you know, different stages of different different environments uh, have different requirements, you know. And it's a shame we don't have the score, but it, it brought me close to think to the practical nature of uh, putting on an opera. The plot to Dido and Aeneas is based on book four of Virgil's Aeneid and incorporates elements from the English mask tradition. I'm sure you're familiar with it, and I don't mean that ironically, but suffice it to say that the opera recounts the love of Dido, queen of Carthage, for the Trojan hero Aeneas and her despair when he abandons her to found a new Troy on Latin soil. The opera ends with Dido's Lament, When I Am Laid in Earth, one of the most recognizable English Baroque songs to the modern ear. Wallen and Stace's new opera, Dida's Ghost, is, as already mentioned, a sequel. We've put the synopsis of the play on the webpage for this episode, the link to that is in the show notes, so I won't go into great detail. But an interesting characteristic of the interplay between new and old is built into the second act, where, after Dido's sister is welcomed to Aeneas's court, an entertainment is given, where Purcell's opera is performed as a sort of play within a play. with Anna playing the role of Dido, her sister, and Aeneas playing himself. I felt that John Bart and Freddie Wake Walker and the singers themselves were very, very helpful, but also very direct in 
in sort of steering us. So, for example, John Butt said, you know, rather than have the Purcell up for separated out, find ways of folding the Purcell into my own. And what I loved about that, it meant that the Purcell, in the end, that tells the story of the sequel. So we, you know, like, for instance, uh, at the end when Aeneas dies. Spoiler alert! We hear Purcell. The last aria is um, is When I Am Laid in Earth. But it makes sense with our story. So it's as if we're not just, it, it, it's not just a companion piece. The two blur. And there's there's many moments in the text of the Purcell that, that we use and like we revisit scenes. So for example, there's, a, I can't remember which scene, there's, there's a scene where, and it's very, very brief in the Purcell, where Aeneas announces that he has to leave Carthage and go and found Rome. He has to leave. And Dido is shocked by this, but she she's also very proud. So she says, no. Aeneas sees how shocked she is, and she says, no, go, go. She's very proud. We revisit that. And Aeneas has the chance to ask Dido what happened after he left. So it's as if we complete, we not only have provide a sequel, but we go back to certain tensions and moments that were in the Purcell and, and just open them. It was a very satisfying, creative journey. Despite the name of your opera and that Dido was the central character in Purcell's work, does Aeneas get more attention in Dido's Ghost? Our opera's called Dido's Ghost, but it's very much about Aeneas and a man's story through regret and grief and the fact that he's been haunted by this love. A man, you know, towards the end of his life. He goes on, I'd say, the biggest journey in, in the work. And we understand his grief, which is... It's greater than Dido's. He's a broken man at the end, but we are, but we understand him. And the performance by Matthew Brook is, I think, one of the best stage experiences I've had. I, in the dress rehearsal, where I heard the work and saw the work for the first time straight through. And every time it came to that moment, I was so sad. And I remained sad for months afterwards. And even now, I, I think about Aeneas and I'm really sad. But before I started to write this, I didn't realise the, the power of the Purcell to tell a new story. But what I feel is very modern about ours, it, it is exploring how Aeneas is very vulnerable. He has been this great hero, but you feel that he is, he is examining himself and through meeting Anna, trying to make amends for something he knew was the wrong thing to do. In composing this opera, did you feel as if you were part of a continuing tradition? Do you know, I I felt very clearly that I was part of a tradition. And I think the tradition of, say, particularly writing stage works, you understand that opera is a very fluid form and so much of the creation of it is to do with necessity. And when you're writing for the stage, things are very untidy. You have to you have to have a stage instinct, but you also have to work with quite simple elements to bring out characterizations. And so when I was looking at the Purcell, to begin with, I was very nervous because whenever I would read about, uh, was doing my research, and reading about this opera, that I felt I was reading so much scholarly work, which slightly put the work at a distance to me. So I had to stop doing that. And I had to de- deal directly with the score and the notes and try and imagine Henry Purcell uh, scratching the notes out on, on paper. And that's it. And then I felt I got very close to him, but also the elements of what, what goes into writing music. Writing music, you have an idea, but then you have to continue that idea. You have to use variation. You have to bring out the character of the words. You have to make characters uh, rich and you have to provide the atmosphere. So it was it was wonderful. I felt as if I was almost holding hands with him across centuries, even though I'm from a completely different culture. But I also felt, uh, it sounds a funny thing to say, I felt I was the right person to do it. For example... Dido and Nice was written for a very specific English, you know, English, it's very stylized mask. And I was also bringing out the African elements and staging wise, Dido had to be black. And also, um, well, Belinda was black as well. She doubles up occasionally as Anna, her sister. And just by seeing that on the stage, that changed the whole dynamics of the theatre. But I realised if, if, it wasn't me. Somebody else may not have pushed for that because they, it wouldn't have occurred to them because Dido Nias has become this very stylized, very um, English and very, you know, it's a pale skinned opera. But that's not the story when you go back to the Virgil. Purcell's Dido and Aeneas was scored in four parts, which at its most basic would mean a small Baroque orchestra. Did Dido's ghost differ in its instrumentation from the Purcell? I, want, I added 
electric bass guitar and I added some percussion, quite minimal percussion, but it does include drum kit. I actually had made, specially for it, a hand pan. A hand pan sounds a little bit like a, a very mellow steel pan. I'd composed for this before and I was very mesmerized by the sound. And then I used things like crotales, cymbals, some hand percussion, so quite light, but it definitely adds this other dimension to the world. And that was for character reasons but it, it just actually worked very, very well uh, and nothing seemed to jar. And there are moments when we just use, you know, the string and we just... I, so basically throughout the whole work, I felt my, and my duty was to also to handle the textures of the work to make that underpin any dramatic emotional scenes. In composing for this opera, did your musical ideas come exclusively from engaging with the Purcell and with Wesley Stace's libretto after the project was greenlit, or were there other influences? So there's one aria that I'm particularly pleased with. I have to say the music for that came from years ago when I, I'd written a poem, because I've long been obsessed with this character of Dido. Ever since I read, studied Latin, you know, as a kid, reading about Dido and Aeneas lit a spark in my mind, and so I didn't know I'd ever write an opera about it. But I had written this poem much later, and then I decided to write music, which is sort of based on the personal, but it has much more modern harmony. And uh, that song is called Of Crumpling Rocks. But so I brought that song into this opera but with new words, because I just felt it was so perfect. I had never known that, that that song would be an opera, but I couldn't think that I could do anything better that leads into the lament, but it does so using really distinctive harmonies that you could say drew on jazz as anything else. So that's an example of me using some music that had already existed, but that was based on the Purcell and was like, was like a conversation with the Purcell. Another parallel that you draw with Purcell's opera is that Dido's ghost also ends with the lament, When I am laid in earth, except this time sung by the character of Aeneas, as you've said earlier in this interview. Would you like to tell us more about that decision? When you're, when you're composing an opera, you always have to think of, for me anyway, I, I like to think of the different speeds, the different rhythms, places that are very active and other places that are very still. So I suppose that, that particular aria is, it has a stillness to it, the way we have at the end with the Purcell, which to my mind is one of the best arias that ever been sung. And, and the thing about When I'm Laid, the lament, is that it has been sung by so many people and so many people outside the classical music tradition. So Jeff Buckley um, is a person and I heard singing. I've sung it myself with um with with a band, you know, it's a beautiful thing to sing and when you sing it you're taken to another place. Not a As we wrap up this interview, do you have any final words for our listeners? I, I feel so strongly that opera will never die while we have such rich resources available to us. Erlen Wallen, thank you very much for speaking to us today. Thank you very much. That concludes Episode 7 from this, the third season of the Early Music Podcast. In the next episode, I speak with multidisciplinary artist Bjorn Schmelzer about early music revivals, modernism, and whether traditional music-making practices help or complicate our understanding of early music. Thanks for listening.